Welcome to Valley Politics. I'm Terry Christensen, your host for this new show on politics and public policy in Silicon Valley and the South Bay. Today on our show, we'll interview San Jose's new mayor, Sam Licardo, and learn more about his election campaign and his priorities for his time in office. We'll also have an update on what's going on in San Jose's Council District 10, that's the Almaden Valley in Southwest San Jose, with Councilman Johnny Camus. And we visited the office of Ron Gonzalez, who served as San Jose Mayor from 1999 to 2007 for our Where Are They Now feature. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo. Thank you, Terry. We want to hear about your priorities for your first year in office, but we're political junkies on this show, so we have to start by talking about the campaign a little bit. So let's just start with what you think was the key to your success. What, what, what was the best thing you did in the campaign? Uh, we had a great team, and that's really uh, what won it for us. Uh, ably managed by Reagan Hanager, our campaign manager, we had a great team of volunteers and, and really young uh, staff who really kept their cool during very tough times. There were a lot of times in the campaign where things didn't look like they were going the right way and everybody just stayed on board, stayed positive. And uh, we had a, a great strategy of getting out to a lot of homes to meet people one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. And uh, my wife managed this effort to, to keep us connected with about 160 hosts of gatherings in the front yards and backyards of, of homes throughout the city. And that really enabled me to have that kind of contact with mm -hmm. folks you know, five people at a time, 25 people at a time, that really helps you build momentum in a campaign. Talk about those scary moments for the staff and, and, and for you. What Was there a time in the campaign when you were really nervous? Yeah, right before we announced, because really? we were having our kickoff and I wasn't sure anyone was gonna show up other than my mom. <laughs> so I was just glad we had a good turnout and everybody had a good time. Um, I, you know, I went into this campaign knowing that we were far from the favorites and so, Honestly, there was not really a scary moment because I think we all went in knowing there was a substantial chance we weren't going to win this thing. You were scared the whole time? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> we, were, we were underdogs yeah. and we, um, we acted like it. You know, we worked hard and kept our head down and didn't worry too much about the bad news because we knew if we just kept our head down through the finish line, uh, we'd, we'd give it a good run. Very smart. Yeah. You won by 2,750 votes out of about 180,000. That's pretty close. Yes. And it was a low turnout election mm -hmm. and a divided city. West side voted heavily for you. East side voted heavily for your opponent. That's hardly a mandate. It's a victory, mm -hmm. but it's hardly a mandate. Yeah. So how has that shaped your thinking as you take office and in your first year? Well, you know, interestingly, we looked back at other elections and, and three of the last four really contested elections where you had a, uh, a non-incumbent running for mayor, similar dem very demographics, close, yes. east versus west, very close yes. uh, margins. So some, nothing really new in San Jose, uh, but it's very apparent that this divide between east and west has become exacerbated as the valley has grown more economically divided. And, and so I've really focused in the early months of my term uh, on two issues. One is safety and the other is really broadening opportunity in this city city, really ensuring that many of those families who feel left behind by the Valley's boom uh, can play a greater role. So uh, everything from focusing on educational opportunities for kids uh, after school, expanding libraries, uh, expanding teen job opportunities, and initiative we'll be announcing soon around expanding manufacturing job opportunities. Those things that will enable folks uh, to have uh, a better chance at, uh, at being able to thrive here in the Valley. Carl Guardino, with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for independent expenditures to support your campaign. And some people say now he's your vice mayor. We know Rose Herrera is really your vice mayor. <laughs> but what do you say to that? Is Carl your behind the scenes vice mayor? Well, you know, if folks wanted to know what I was gonna do, uh, I pretty well telegraphed it uh, before I ran for mayor and I wrote a book. And uh, I pretty, wrote a pretty long book about all the things I was going to do. And pretty much everything we've announced has been something I wrote about in that book. And I wrote that book. Nobody else did. I listened, listened to a lot of folks' ideas about what we could do. 
Uh, but fundamentally, everything I'm doing is consistent with what I said I was going to do from the get-go. Uh, I'm grateful for Carl's friendship. We've been friends for, mm -hmm. for over a decade, and we've worked on everything from transit efforts to bring BART here to uh, affordable housing uh, to uh, initiative we launched to, to boost tutoring in schools. Uh, so I'm grateful certainly for all the, the help I've had from Carl and, and his guidance and advice, uh, but uh, I'm a pretty independent guy, and I'll stay that way. Even with all that money being spent on your behalf. Well, you know, I, uh, I had to raise $2 million myself in this yeah. campaign. And yeah. uh, it, it's no fun raising money, <laughs> uh, everybody admits. And uh, the same was true for my opponent. He had to raise all that money as well, had lots of independent expenditures coming in from, you know, casinos and all kinds of groups. Yeah. Uh, the reality is, is you have to raise money. Uh, and then at some point or another, you've got to lead. And a campaign is different from running a city. Well, let's talk more about running the city. You talked about some of your priorities when we talked about the east-west divide, but what are some of the other top, top priorities or goals for you in, in the immediate future and the longer term? Well, certainly safety is on everyone's mind, and uh, we all know we need more police officers, and resolving the ongoing pension battle is a critical component of that, and I'm glad to say that our, uh, our officers' uh, union is now at the table and we're, we're beginning negotiations. Uh, but there are a lot of things I think we can do to make San Jose safer um, while we're working on restoring the police department. And, and we've been working on everything from uh, launching a uh, video camera registry uh, citywide to mm -hmm. see how we can uh, leverage the many homeowners and store owners uh, uh, cameras that are out there to, to help police uh, doing things uh, with data that can help police b better uh, deploy their scarce officers, expanding community service officer program, which has been very effective so far, and, and really helping uh, our, our team that's focused on teens, that is the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force. A lot of nonprofits are involved in that effort, a lot of partners. Uh, we're expanding teen jobs this summer in collaboration with the county. We hope we can get 1,000 teens employed. Uh, and uh, we're working on a lot of efforts to see how we can get to our teens before the gangs do. Um, well, you mentioned negotiations with the police officers. What about the city employees generally? Do you think you're going to be able to reach an accommodation? Are you considering dropping the city's legal suit on uh, Measure B, the city's appeal on Measure B? We're uh, looking forward to negotiating with everyone. Uh, all the unions, I'm told, are going to be at the table within the next week and a half. Uh, the dates have been set, and so, so that's all good news. Uh, there's no question that there needs to be compromise on both sides. Uh, there's going to be some revising to uh, revisions to everything from disability uh, to the pension and medical, uh, retiree medical care uh, uh, issues. Uh, all the, the, the parts of Measure B that have been in dispute. Uh, the reality remains we still need to have savings uh, yeah. because we can't restore services without it. Uh, we're going to probably need a tax increase to pay for services. Uh, and it also remains the case that, you know, even if we just drop the suit uh, today or dropped our challenge of the appeal, yeah. uh, the, the Superior Court already upheld all the provisions that are really necessary for us essentially to save a lot of dollars that I'm pretty certain neither side wants fully implemented. For example, the portion of the measure that would essentially force a, a 4 percent pay reduction every year. Uh, if we don't get the, the desired savings. Well, that's in the measure it was upheld. I don't think anybody wants that to remain. So we need to negotiate really for both sides. And this will have to go back to the voters at some point? Yes, the idea would be it would go back in 2016. As part of a comprehensive settlement, we'd agree on revenue increase as well as a resolution on the, on the pension reform. Um, you mentioned the possibility of a, t a tax measure uh, on the ballot. We should talk about that for a minute uh, because another big piece of the problem for San Jose, as you know so well, is that we're actually underfunded in terms of tax base. So yeah. many, most other cities in the region have significantly higher revenue per capita than San Jose does. So what's your thinking about what we need to do besides put a tax measure on the ballot? What else can we do to strengthen the tax base? Yeah, there's a lot of things we need to do to improve the tax base. The first is to stop digging the hole any deeper. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of public discussion about our revision of the general plan this year, our review of it, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of desire from developers who want to convert land that's been designated for industrial or commercial use into housing. And uh, that's a big erosion of our tax base, and that means we have more services to have to provide. So it's critical that we really hold the line in significant ways against large-scale erosion of that tax base. Uh, 
And obviously we need to do more to attract companies uh, and more than anything help companies grow in place. And so uh, I'll be announcing an initiative focused on our older industrial buildings, how we can reutilize those as manufacturing, tech manufacturing centers that really expand job opportunities, particularly for our blue collar workforce. Uh, and uh, we'll be focused on specific initiatives in North San Jose and downtown where we can really start to uh, capitalize on the momentum that exists today. We've seen 35 tech companies move into downtown in the last year and a half alone. So there's a lot of momentum emerging. We just need to make sure we get out of the way to keep it going. But still a tax measure for 2016, sales tax, quarter yeah, of a Yeah, likely, likely a sales yeah. tax. Yeah, we'll be doing polling and trying to understand uh, what exactly the public's willing to pay for. General tax or specified tax? You know, good question, all to be determined. Yeah. Uh, it's likely a general tax, but Which it's- Which only takes 50% plus that's one. That's correct. Much easier to but, pass. But lots going to be determined by what we learn from polling and, and listening to our residents. The city will also have sort of competition. It's something that we all want, or a lot of us want, and that's a VTA. Uh, tax measure to fund BART to San Jose. So what's your thinking about how those two taxes yeah, play out together? Not likely to be on the same measure no, or on the same, uh, at the same time. Um, there will likely be a November measure on transportation that would include BART and street maintenance. We badly need more pavement out there and to fill some potholes yeah. and other transportation projects. That's a countywide measure that VTA would be pushing. Uh, and then citywide would be focused in June. Citywide in June, VTA probably in November. That's the likely yeah. line, lineup, but we'll yeah. learn more. What's your sense of voters' attitude about that from your experience with the campaigns? You know, I think folks are, uh, are certainly, uh, they, they're tired of seeing the services cut year after yeah. year, and that's, there's no question about that. People are willing to pay more if they know they're going to get more service. They don't want to pay more just to go into a giant black hole for pensions. They don't want to just pay more uh, and be running in place. They want to know they're going to get more service. And that's the great challenge for us, whether we choose a general or specific tax. Uh, we've got to have protections in place that ensures that we're actually increasing services with the dollars that we're getting. You've got a pretty new city council. How are you getting along with your new colleagues? You know, really well. Well, actually. what else could you say? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yes, that's true, although in this case it has the advantage of also being true. <laughs> uh, you know, we just had the budget message approved unanimously yeah. last week. Uh, our a member of our team went and did some research uh, with, with the city manager staff and asked when was the last time we got a unanimous vote on a budget, and I guess it was about 10 years ago. Uh, folks are, are working together. We recognize we've got a common challenge here, which is restoring services, bringing the city back together through what has been, we all know, a very painful time. Yes. And, uh, and improving safety, and I think everybody's pretty focused on those goals. Good. We're almost out of time, but I have to ask you, becoming the mayor of a big city like San Jose must be overwhelming at first, uh, but what's the most fun thing that's happened since you've been mayor? I, uh, I tell a lot of bad jokes, Terry, and I have an we awful all know sense that, of humor. Sam. Yeah, the thing is that when you're mayor, people <laughs> laugh a lot more. So that's what I yeah, really Yeah, I'm laughing enjoy. now. Thank you, I appreciate that, Terry. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. It's been great to talk to you. Thanks, Harry. It's been a pleasure. Now let's get the latest news on District 10 with Council Member Johnny Camus. Hello, I'm San Jose Council Member Johnny Camus from District 10. District 10 encompasses the Amadan Valley, Blossom Hill, Vista Park, and the western portion of the Santa Teresa Foothills neighborhood. Our major commercial area includes Westfield Oak Ridge Mall, which is continually updating its restaurant and retail offerings to meet the changing needs of shoppers in the region. Oak Ridge is home to the largest Apple computer store in the Bay Area. It also plays host to the annual Westfield Oak Ridge Mall Winter Walk for Seniors, coordinated by my office. We are fortunate to have several smaller plazas in District 10 as well. These are home to the types of locally owned operated small businesses that are the backbone of our community. Recreation is important to the residents of District 10 and our parks, trails and sports facilities are heavily utilized by both residents and visitors. Amadan Lake Park is popular year round and last year we began a new tradition of Independence Day fireworks. Other popular parks include the T.J. Martin and Jeffrey Fontana parks, and improvements are almost complete on Chris Hotz Park in the Hoffman Viamonte neighborhood. 
My family and I use Los Alamitos Bicycle Trail frequently, as do many of our neighbors, and I'm working with Mayor Licardo and my colleagues on City Council to connect this trail to Guadalupe Trail to create a contiguous route from Almaden Valley to downtown San Jose and beyond. The beautiful new soccer fields of the Patty O'Malley Community Sports Complex and Allen at Steinbeck School opened just last year thanks to the generous donation of District 10 resident from whom the complex is named. Finally, a new one and a half acre community garden will soon be developed at Marshall Cottle State and County Park, a 350 acre park generously donated by the Lester family. Please contact me or visit our website to sign up for my email newsletter to find out more about what's happening in District 10. Now it's time for Where Are They Now? Today we present the first part of an exclusive interview with Ron Gonzalez, who served as Santa Clara County Supervisor from 1989 to 1996, and then as the 63rd Mayor of San Jose from 1999 to 2007. Let's find out what he's up to now. Ron Gonzalez, thank you for welcoming us to your office today and for talking with us. Almost 30 years in public office, City of Sunnyvale, Santa Clara County, Mayor of San Jose till 2007. What have you been doing since then? <laughs> Enjoying life. Good. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a wonderful time. It's uh, been eight years now. You know, time flies when you're having fun. And <laughs> part of the time I was, uh, uh, my wife and I were running our own marketing consulting business. Uh, but most of the time I've been here at the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley as the president and CEO, running this wonderful organization, doing all that we possibly can to improve the quality of life for Silicon Valley Latinos. Well, that's a major mission. Eight years as mayor, though, what do you miss about being mayor? I miss the people. You know, I miss the interaction with the neighborhoods. Uh, certainly my own mayor staff, I was so blessed to have uh, a wonderful group of people, professionals who work for me and with me and for the city and so I miss the daily engagement with them working on projects to improve uh, San Jose to lead San Jose into the, a new future which we spent eight years working at and certainly the city employees although I see many of them in uh, you know throughout San Jose at the, mm -hmm. the grocery stores and the coffee shops and those types of things but the daily interaction with neighborhoods is what I miss the most uh, although this job has allowed me to re-engage the community but certainly not 24-7 like the mayor's job. What got you into politics in the first place? What inspired you? What gave you the confidence to actually run for office? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I think all of us think back to certain points in our childhood. And I, in my young adulthood or, you know, young childhood and probably more, more specifically, I remember distinctly listening to John F. Kennedy making his inaugural speech where he said, you know, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Mm -hmm. I would say that was kind of the first time I began to think about politics and political science. And then, of course, living with my father, who was a community yeah. leader here in the San Jose, Silicon Valley, or we call it Santa Clara County in those days, uh, civil rights movements in the 1960s and his active engagement in the community. And, and a, a, a principle that he instilled in each of his five children, which was basically that we have a responsibility, all of us do. Uh, to find some point in our lives where we improve the lives of others. I found, uh, for me, that was public service. So, you know, I ran for uh, the city council in my hometown of Sunnyvale, and then it, it took off from there. But like most people who uh, serve at the local elected uh, level is, uh, you know, my, my, my initial uh, engagement was in my neighborhood. You know, it was being a neighborhood leader, uh, and then it just kind of mushroomed up from there. It's a great way to start, and the family inspiration is really important. It was. What, what, are, what, what accomplishments as mayor are you most proud of now? Wow. You know, I don't know that we have enough time uh, to talk about <laughs> Just all give of us them. the top two. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, we were very instrumental in moving San Jose forward, as I like to say. Uh, our affordable housing programs, uh, our strong neighborhoods initiative, uh, setting the stages for what became the new uh, San Jose Mineta International Airport, the construction of the new City Hall downtown, the new Martin Luther King Library at San Jose State, 
uh, all of those branch libraries and neighborhoods and fire stations and neighborhoods who didn't have them before. But beyond the buildings that, are, that, that signify San Jose kind of reconnecting with its neighborhoods, I would say just the overall um, feeling that I tried to instill in City Hall that, that, that connected City Hall with those neighborhoods and with citizens in San Jose, with people who call this their home, with people that love this city of San Jose. You know, before and in most cities, people are connected with City Hall when they have an issue or yeah. need, but we kind of reversed that relationship. And I was very proud of the fact that, that we literally trained hundreds of city workers how to actively listen to the people they were meeting out in the city streets. And, and I think that led to a feeling and an understanding that I tried to instill in city workers that, from my experience, people who live in San Jose uh, look to the city for some very basic kinds of services. And the way they judge city services is from their driveway. You know, when they go out and pick up the, the, the mail or the morning newspaper, they look around. Is the street clean? Is it safe? Is the park across the street graffiti free? All these types of things that people see in their own neighborhood is how they judge city services. And out of Strong Neighborhoods Initiative, there is a legacy of community activists as well as, as retrained city staff. Absolutely, and you know, a lot of those, a lot of those people who became those activists started out that process pretty skeptical mm -hmm. about Absolutely. whether city, you know, the city, yeah, with whether the city would really listen to them. Uh, and and let's face it, you know, there were 20 neighborhoods uh, in that process. Not every one of them turned out the way initially that we wanted it to because they were being led by city staff, not the other way around. So in some cases, we had them start back at ground, you know, step number one, and work back through the process. But ultimately, every one of those presentations made by those neighborhood groups, those you know, neighborhood or SNI advisory groups, as we called them, was, was led by the community, organized by the community, and those people you know, felt that level of success at the end. And again, lots of those folks are still active. Uh, thank God. One of the policy areas you didn't <clears throat> mention in that impressive list is education. I was one of the skeptics when you ran for mayor in 1998 and said you were going to be the education mayor. And we all said, no, 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 what's Ron talking about? Education is not a responsibility of the city, of not of this city, yeah. at least. But you did things in education. What were your accomplishments there? Well, I never bought into the fact that, that the city shouldn't do something about education. Because the city, for example, just one small example, the mayor really doesn't control the Valley Transportation Agency. But yet you would expect the mayor to be you know, integrately involved in transportation policy and programs that you know help commuters get from where they live to work and back home in time for dinner as I like to say. But in education I felt that middle class families judge a city on two things and they judge that city in terms of whether they're going to make an investment and buy a home in a city on two factors. One, how safe is the neighborhood and how good are the public schools. And, and our public schools needed a partnership with City Hall. So we began that partnership by, by meeting with school superintendents, school board members, with parents, with, uh, with students and teachers. And we began to say, you know, what role can we provide that no one else can do? And that led to programs like our teacher housing program where we helped over 530 public school teachers buy their first home in the city of San Jose at a time when the market was yeah. up, right? So it was not easy, but we made it happen. We had after school homes, uh, after school homework centers in, in 250 neighborhoods. We had uh, a preschool program called Smart Start in about 20 neighborhoods where we saw the test scores and, and aptitude scores of children entering kindergarten not ready to learn. And so we saw the, the very early signs of success by investing in that, pre that preschool type of program. Uh, we made our schools safer with the, working with our police departments on lockdown procedures. So I think it was a true uh, partnership between City Hall and, our, and the 18 school districts that serve the children mm -hmm. of San Jose. And to the point where, you know, the, the, the superintendents we work with most closely used to call me the, the education mayor, uh, at, you know, poking a little fun at me. But, but I, I, you know, I had that, I held that title with a lot of respect because it meant that our city was truly, you know, working as a partner with our, with our schools. So we have a new mayor. What's your best advice for him? Oh, my best advice for, for Mayor Licardo, you know, I, I think, I think um, the challenge a mayor has in a city this large, people really don't understand how big San Jose is. I didn't understand. And I think, you know, Mayor Reed probably didn't understand how the demands. 
um, you don't know what you don't know, and you start to learn the, the first day in office. But there'll be there'll be demands coming from everyone. One of the things that I practiced uh, week after week was spending Saturdays out in the neighborhoods, out in the communities. And there are different ways we did that. You know, we had the neighborhood cleanups, we had graffiti removal programs. You got to find ways to reach out and stay in touch with those people in the neighborhoods. Because once you're, once you're in that city hall, it's like inside the beltway. It becomes a world of its own. But that's not the real world. The real word, world is out there in the east side of San Jose or in Berrios or uh, you know, Evergreen, the west side of San Jose, all, you know, Alviso, all of these neighborhoods that make up this great city. You know, the wonderful thing about San Jose is that we, we're, you know, we're home to a million people. But time after time when visitors would visit us, and I would talk to them about their visit, the one thing that they always shared was they were always surprised that this was, it had a small town feel to that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that they're compatible. Having a small town feeling by people that, yeah, I can access government, I can access my council member, my mayor, whatever, but also be proud of the fact that we're a city on the move. And, and I think uh, Mayor Licardo uh, is gonna get us back on the move uh, during his term. One of our new mayor's challenges will be he doesn't have the redevelopment agency. You used redevelopment agency funds for affordable housing, strong neighborhoods initiative, capital improvements of, of all sorts, not, not to mention downtown. Um, how can he compensate for that? Well, he can't. He can't all by himself and all by the city self. He, he, this is going to be an era of partnership and, and being extremely creative of how do you form partnerships. On the other hand, I think I think the mayors of California, the Big Ten mayors as they call themselves, are going to need to get together. They're going to meet. They're going to need to meet with Governor Brown and the state legislature, and find a state solution to the affordable mm -hmm. housing crisis. This is epidemic issues here, epidemic level. Uh, the uh, the number of families in in places like Silicon Valley and other major urban centers of California who cannot afford another rent increase. Uh, is incredible. And I think that there's a very high percentage of families, not individuals, families who are literally one rent increase away from being on the streets. And when that begins to happen, uh, you're going to see a homeless population in San Jose, in Silicon Valley, in the state of California just exploding. The problem is I don't see anybody calling that meeting together. Yeah. And I think it needs to be done the same way that you would have a, a natural emergency catastrophe type of thing. Uh, a state of emergency, I think, on affordable housing is desperately needed. Well, I'm sure the Hispanic Foundation will be there when the meeting is called. If we're allowed in the room, I'll be there talking. Stay tuned for the second part of this interview next month. But for now, please visit our website at createtvsj.org or send us an email at valleypolitics at createtvsj.org for any comment you might have. Also, you can follow us on Facebook where you can post your comments about the show or suggest guests or topics for us. Remember, you can make a difference in your community like all of our guests just by stepping forward and getting involved. And now, that's all folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics today. See you next time. Eli Thomas Menswear is a proud sponsor of Valley Politics, Italian contemporary clothing for today's executive lifestyle. Eli Thomas Menswear is located at 350 South Winchester Boulevard, next to Santana Row.